Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I'm Wilmer Leon. Here's the point. We have a tendency to view current events as though they happen in a vacuum, failing to understand the broader historical context in which most events take place. During each episode, my guests and I have probing, provocative, and in-depth discussions that connect the dots between current events and the broader historic context in which these events take place. This enables you to better understand and analyze the events that are impacting the global village in which we live. On today's episode, the issue before us is What are the problems facing African-American aviators and other aviators of color in the commercial aviation space? To assist me with this discussion, let's turn to my guest. He's a man with well over 12,000 hours in the cockpit, uh, in the commercial cockpit. He is Captain Clovis Jones, retired. Captain Jones, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. If you would please uh, introduce yourself, you have such a broad, such a vast resume. Uh, I don't want to give short shrift to any of your accomplishments, so please take a moment and uh, and introduce yourself, sir. Okay, Clovis Jones Jr., born in Dawson, Georgia. I wanted to be a pilot since I was four years old. I actually uh, turned down a scholarship to Morehouse College in pre-med to go to the Army's high school to flight school program. However, my recruiter put something different on my contract. Uh, uh, One reason is that he didn't get credit for recruiting officers. Uh, And secondly, in in that part of the world as a black person, that was not something that, uh, you know, people who look like him uh, wanted people like me who look like me to do. So I wound up in the infantry for three years, got out and asked for my scholarship back and uh, went to Morehouse for a semester and was called by the Army's aviation department to see if I was still interested in flight school. And I said yes. So I really re-enlisted into the Army and did go to flight school, uh, completing flight school. I was a turnaround flight instructor for both uh, the Huey helicopter and for the Huey gunships. Deployed to Vietnam as uh, an instructor pilot, a safety officer, and assistant ops officer. Uh, my second tour in Vietnam, 10 days prior to that end, I was commissioned in the Army's field artillery branch as a second lieutenant aviator. Uh, returning to the States, I went to the basic course field artillery, then to the Army Aviation's uh, school at Fort Rucker, Alabama, and became an academic instructor. Uh, Leaving the Army after about 10 years of active duty, I um, got my first flying job with Hughes Helicopters uh, when they were working on the uh, Army's new um, attack helicopter, the Apache. And I was there from its uh, in the flight test department, the Hughes Helicopters, from the the building of the helicopter to its uh, initial test flight through its delivery to the Army. Um, Then my second flying job was with Xerox Flying Executives third flying job with Western Airlines, which is now part of Delta Airlines, then to American, and then to Air California, which is now part of American. And I found a home at FedEx and uh, retired from FedEx as an MD-11 captain. I um, have been involved in uh, uh, flight organizations, uh, both black and white, and uh, current pr- president of the United States Army Black Aviation Association and former president of the Organization of Black Airline Pilots, which is now the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. And my most recent flying job was with, uh, as a captain with JSX, a, uh, a regional airline. You, uh, you're you rated to fly both, as you just mentioned, your, uh, helicopters and fixed wing aircraft. How unique is that for an aviator, particularly an African-American aviator? Well, I don't know how unique it is, but th- there are few of us who are dual rated <laughs> and uh, and even fewer who were who are black. During Vietnam era, there were only about 600 black uh, army uh, aviators. So there's a book 600 more or less. And so to be dual rated that that that's that's rare. To be dual rated that that is rare. Um, b- before we go any further, I'd be remiss if I if I did not mention the passing of Captain David E. Harris, 
uh, the first African-American pilot for a major U.S. passenger carrier. Uh, he died March 8th at the age of 89. And he is, uh, uh, he, he once said, there's no way I should be the first. Uh, it should have been, it should have happened long before 1964. I know you were friends or, with Captain Harris. If you could speak about him and his accomplishments. Well, uh, Dave Harris, just, uh, just a prince of a gentleman. He was just outstanding in all ways. Uh, he was a mentor. He was a good friend. Uh, based on his experiences, he basically told us what to look out for. And that was a time where the airlines would use uh, sickle cell trait testing to, to keep us from being hired. Mm. Yes. Uh, you know, either you have sickle cell and, uh, you know, one blood test says it all, but they would continue to, to test you to see if you had the trait. And that was one way that they would not bring us on board. And another was testing. So Dave Harris uh, uh, with American Airlines, uh, he, he challenged that. And so with the, the psychological testing, which had no barrier on you becoming uh, a pilot. So he challenged that as well as the, uh, the uh, repeated blood testing to see if somehow, if we didn't have the sickle cell trait with the first blood test, they would keep testing you, hoping that... Uh, uh, you would uh, show the trait and they could deny you hiring. So he, he, that was one of the milestones. And he uh, was a, a, one of the presidents of the organization of black airline pilots, but just, just a prince of a gentleman. You know, mentioning the psychological testing, one would think uh, someone with your background, Vietnam uh, aviator, that all of the trials and tribulations that you went through overseas that the fact that you survived that should be enough psychological testing <laughs> uh, to warrant you to be a commercial. I mean, if you, if, if, if you can fly there, you can probably deal with passengers going between Dallas and wherever it is you're going to go. Um, but that sounds as though that was another exclusionary process, not an inclusionary process. Yeah, that's correct. That is correct. And, uh, and uh, when Marlon Green won his uh, Supreme Court decision uh, that broke the barriers of us uh, being kept out of the industry, he was hired, but not trained. So he didn't get a chance to fly. So it was a delay even in that process. So there are a lot of delaying tactics that were used. And uh, there are those that are still out there. <laughs> Talk a little bit about Marlon Green. He was an Air Force uh, aviator hired by Continental in, I think, 1957, but they rescinded his offer. And then it took about six years for it to go through the Supreme Court, and the ruling uh, was in his favor and sent a very wide message to the U.S. airline in industry about hiring. And I think th he started flying for Continental in 65, is that right? Uh, roughly around that time. I'm not okay. sure exactly on the exact year or date, uh, but you look at his background, he was well qualified to be hired. Mm -hmm. But then when they found out he was black, they rescinded it. So that's when he uh, engaged in the lawsuit that wound up uh, making his way to the Supreme Court. But this industry was supposed to be all white. Uh, Curtis Collins, a uh, uh, congressman from mm -hmm. uh, Illinois, uh, she knew some of us pilots, so and and we talked about the, the challenges, trials, and tribulations. So a congressional study was uh, initiated, and the University of Pittsburgh did that study, and it showed that the airline, commercial airline industry, was to be all white, not not a janitor, not a baggage handler, or anything. Ooh, even so down that, to that, even down to that level, that, down to that level. And the other piece is that. Um, the Airline Pilots Association, Alpha, had a clause in its bylaws that uh, if you were black, you could not be a member. So even if an airline did hire you, you were not allowed on the property. So it was uh, no point in them hiring you. That sounds like the uh, American Bar Association, sounds like <laughs> the American Dental Association. I s there were so many uh, professional organizations. I know, for example, 
my grandfather was a was a dentist. He graduated from Howard in 1911 and was the first African-American licensed dentist in New Orleans. But he could not join the American Dental Association. So he had to go to their conventions and wait tables so that he could be in the room while the latest advances in dentistry were, were being discussed. So it, it sounds like the airline industry was right along the same lines as so many of the other uh, professional organizations in this country in terms of their restrictive uh, re uh, restrictive covenants and whatnot. Well, well, you know that that was just a ref reflection of, of America. What mm -hmm. what it was all about. Mm -hmm. We we were to serve others, and we were not to advance, and we would to have restrictions on what we could do, what professions to go into. Nevertheless, with with that in place. We did all we, we were there was no profession that we were not proficient in. And and, and as a point of history, uh, from Pineville, Louisiana, there was a gentleman by the name of Charles Frederick Page who had a flying machine. It was uh, a lighter than air, kind of like a balloon, but it had directional control as well as a propeller. So it could move and change directions rather than just go up like a hot air balloon and let the wind take it where it, mm -hmm. where it would. Uh, 1903, he had a patent. <laughs> the patent was finally granted in 1906. Well, he, here, was a, here was a black man who, who, who was born during enslavement, taught himself how to read and write, invented this flying machine, filed for a patent, and eventually was granted a patent. So we've been in and around the industry for a long, long time. Over the past three years or so, we've been hearing a lot about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And according to McKinsey and company in the workplace, these are three closely linked values held by many organizations that are working to be supportive of different groups of individuals, including uh, race, which is an artificial construct, but they list it, so I'll say it. Uh, ethnicities, religions, abilities, genders, and whatnot. Um, with that being said, according to NBC News, tech billionaire and Tesla CEO and SpaceX founder Elon Musk has drawn a lot of recent criticism after he criticized efforts by United Airlines and Boeing to hire non-white pilots and factory workers. He claimed in a series of posts on X that efforts to diversify workforces at these companies have made air travel less safe. Of course, he offered no evidence to support that claim because there is no evidence to support it. Uh, and he winds up getting into this exchange with people talking about it'll take an airplane crashing and killing hundreds of people for them to change this crazy policy. Do you want to fly in an airplane where they prioritize DEI hiring over your safety? And he then went on to say, this is actually happening. And that post got 14 million views within just a few hours. I know you've got some ideas on the issue of DEI, as well as um, some of Elon Musk's comments. And of course, we all know Elon Musk being a, a South African, he was obviously uh, well-trained and, and well-versed. But uh, your thoughts? <laughs> well, on the subject of uh, DEI, or as Elon Musk uh, uh, assembles those uh, D.I.E. D.I.E. <laughs> like, gonna die. <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I when I hear the word diversity, uh, it, it basically it's a non-starter, and I don't like the term when it applies to black people because black people have been in ed every industry. We have been from the White House to the outhouse, back build the White House, build the Capitol, had engineers doing the building of the White House who were black, even though enslavement was 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 the, the status of uh, black folk in the country for the most part. And to that point, designed the city of Washington, D.C. That's right. That's right. 
since so, you mentioned the Capitol and the White House, designed yes. the city of Washington, D.C., <laughs> after having designed the city of Paris. Yes. Well, well he, here you have us serving from, from the highest levels down to the lowest level and excelling. By the way, the first book on hospitality was written by a black man, and it is in the archives of the University of Massachusetts. Here's a successful man who, who basically set the standards for how you serve people in terms of accommodations as well as uh, restaurant service. So we've been at the top of the games in every industry. We wouldn't have the space program that we have. We wouldn't have the internet that we have today. We wouldn't have self-lubricating engines if it wasn't for black people. We wouldn't have turbochargers if it wasn't for black people. So, so I, when I'm hearing this diversity piece, to me, that's just the way to headcount because now we can say we are diverse. We want to include everybody. And yes, they are including everybody because between uh, uh, all different groups and categories that uh, HR departments have, now they can reach out and say, we have the most diverse work group because we have Pacific Islanders, we have Latinos, we have Africans, we have whatever other category you want to name. But then mm -hmm. when it comes to the crux of fairness of black folks, there's an exclusion because you can hire all these others and fulfill your diversity claim, yet avoid hiring black people. So that's that's one of the reasons. And to me, if you are fair in your hiring and you have the standards set and you know what it is that you want, you're going to have a range of people from all colors, all genders, if it's fair. So if it's not fair, then you have these these. Uh, these made up constructs to basically for exclusion purposes. And, now that's my, that's my personal view. Well, and, and to that point also, when you start looking at the categories and the qualifications or the, the demarcations within the categories, you start drilling down into, okay, you have 15 African-Americans. What positions do they hold? Is your CEO African American? Is your CFO African American? Is your COO African American? Uh, you know, within your management structure and management chain, within your uh, elite classification of managers, there, then all of a sudden we fight. We we start to find a different day. Yes, and yeah. <laughs> one of the young fathers that I knew, he was asking me. Uh, uh, you know, I was applying for this company. He says, "Clovis, why aren't you this? Why why aren't, why don't they have you as the chief pilot?" I said, hey, I don't have the complexion for the connection. So, you know, <laughs> that ends that. Did you did you fly uh, President Mandela? No, uh, that was uh, Captain Ray Dothard. Ray Dothard. Oh, OK. Yes, Ray did that. Yes, OK. Yes. OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Uh, so give us a little bit about your your background getting into the industry and overcoming the the barriers that you had to overcome and how prevalent are those problems today? Because when I look at the um, when I look at the data today, um, ninety percent of the of the of the pilots are still white male. Three point four percent are African American. Two point two percent are Asian, and half of a percent are Hispanic or Latino. So those numbers tell me that uh, that that we're still having a problem. In fact, I got a little bit ahead of myself because the, the question I was going to ask you to get into this conversation is, we've spent a lot of time in the 50s and since the 50s singing We Shall Overcome, uh, we can now board a plane and see African-American captains and first officers. Have we overcome? By no means. Things have changed. There are things that are different. There are some things that are better. But the underlying system has just changed. So we still have this uh, system where the overarching piece is that we're encapsulated to only hold certain positions. And that, of course, depends upon the company and the culture of the company. But we don't have, for example, uh, desegregation. Uh, you had that. And then you have uh, the opening of opportunities for the airline. At for quote minorities and women were considered a minority, so there were more white women hired than black pilots. 
And that's still the case today. So overcoming obstacles, my first day on the flight line to be trained as an Army aviator, I had an instructor from the Northeast, from either Vermont or New Hampshire. I don't recall exactly which. But en route to the helicopter for our first flight, he said to me, you look like a pretty good athlete. Do you know who Jackie Robinson is? I said, yes, Jackie's cousin lives down the street from me. Says, well, I think you should get out of the army and go play baseball because black people don't make good pilots. Now, and here's a person who is telling me that I shouldn't be a pilot and he's gonna train me, because, but, but blacks don't make good pilots, so I should leave the program. So I knew what was in front of me. So I went to the flight commander and asked for a change of instructors. And the upshot of that conversation was, well, both of you are new. He's a new instructor. You are his first student. You are yeah. uh, a new uh, warrant officer candidate, and this is your first flight. So it's going to look bad for both of you. And um, he wanted to know why. And I explained to him uh, without saying the guys are racist. And he says, he, he, he mulled over it for a second or two and says, yeah, this is what I'll do. I'll ensure that you have every opportunity that any of the other warrant officer candidates have in this program. And I said, okay, that's good. However, when I come back and ask for a change of instructors, I want a change of instructors, no questions asked. And that is what happened. Um, this gentleman was, you can read the syllabus, you can understand what is to be done and you can mimic it, but there are certain standards or there are certain ways that the army wants you to fly. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't trained to do that during your check rides, you get downgraded. He was teaching me wrong. So I had a, a progress ride. A young instructor who was about the same age as I was, was about 21 years old. And uh, he, he'd been flying. He had his license when he was 16 or 17 years old. He came from a wealthy family and his family uh, got him trained in a helicopter instructor and all that. He asked me to do a... Uh, a taxi. Oh, this is not how we do it. Asked me to do a takeoff. Oh, I got the aircraft. This is not how we do it. He, so he demonstrated every maneuver that he asked me to do because I was doing it as I had been trained to do it. When he showed me the way that I needed to do it in order to meet the standards that were expected of me, I did them as he, as he demonstrated. <laughs> and at the end of the flight, he says, I've got to talk to the, I've got to talk to the flight commander. That's something not right here. You know, you started this flight off unsatisfactory. And uh, now, but you end it, you're above average. But I can't give you an above average because of where you started. I just got to talk to the flight commander and I just smiled. And so I said to myself, I already have. <laughs> so my next uh, day of flying, the, uh, the deputy flight commander, uh, Dick Strauss, need to give him props, and also the flight commander, uh, Sam Countryman, uh, Dick Strauss, uh, we got into the helicopter, flew out to the stage field. We landed. He says, take it around the patch three times and park it on a certain spot. And that's what I did. I soloed that day with this gentleman just flying with me from, from the main heliport at Fort Walters, Texas, out to the stage field that we were operating from that day. And at the end of my primary flight training, uh, Dick Strauss showed me uh, some things that uh, you could do with a helicopter that were not in the syllabus, he said, may come in handy one day. And it did for me because uh, in a Cobra helicopter, which is nose heavy, I was an instructor giving an in-country orientation to a new pilot. And on very short final, we lost our 90 degree gearbox and tail rotor. And without a tail rotor, you do not have directional control in the helicopter. So we went from a nose up attitude to a nose down attitude, spinning right, and it wanted to roll inverted left. And all of that last day of flying that uh, Dick Strauss showed me what a helicopter could do. Instinctively, I did it. I stopped the uh, turn by closing the throttle, right rear cyclic to level the aircraft, pull the collective up, and we spun about 1,800 degrees, like in about two seconds. And But I was able to um, uh, land the helicopter with just minimal damage. And I was told that's the first time that you'd had such a catastrophic failure that either the helicopter was not destroyed or the pilots were not either killed or injured. So everybody you encounter is not against you, but you do have the, 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 the remnants of the shadows of the echoes 
of uh, you still have the echoes of slavery. You still have the echoes of containment of uh, us being in certain categories. And uh, there are people who really want to keep us there and some people who want to put us back there. So that, that, is, that, is, that is prevalent in our industry as well. You're 21 years old. You're in the service, uh, which is a hierarchical organization. And your instructor tells you that you need to leave the service and go play baseball. Yes. Where did you find the intestinal fortitude to, to manage that circumstance by A, uh, not punching him in the face, uh, B, not saying anything derogatory to him and then punching him in the face. Um, you see, I got a thing about punching people in the face. <laughs> uh, but no, so how did, how, did, how, did, how, where did you get that ability to manage that circumstance to your favor, not your detriment? Well, I, I learned firsthand about white racism and uh, at four years old. Uh, we, and we had uh, black insurance agents and white insurance agents come to the house to collect whenever that that cycle was. <laughs> and this one uh, agent, he had a white car. My father had a black car. And so it happens that my father's car was parked in front of the house that day. He pulls up and he calls me over. And I was hesitant about going, but then I did go. He says, uh, come over. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to do anything to you. He said, put your hand on my car. And he and I hesitantly raised my hand. So he put my hand on his car. I said, how does that feel? I said, it feels OK. He said, now go touch your father's hand uh, car. So I put my hand on my father's car. And because it was about uh, 11 o'clock in the day, sunshiny day in the summer, it was hot. I jerked my hand off the car. He said, that's what I wanted to show you. Uh, white is better than black. And from that point on, I didn't like that gentleman anymore. <laughs> so I realized there are people who will be encouraging to you and people who will try to uh, uh, convince you that you should take some lesser position or that you are inferior to them. So, so with that background, it's like, you know, and then I knew about the Tuskegee Airmen at that point. Plus, mm -hmm. one of my mentors, uh, Carl Burhannon, who was the first black presidential pilot, he, when I was in the, uh, an infantryman, he was flying the flying cranes in Vietnam in the first cab division. So I had examples of, of excellent black aviators that I knew about. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm thinking this guy is totally out of his head. And, and, and I know he's not going to train me properly. And so that's why I went to the flight commander and, and asked for a change of instructors. And it worked out in the end. Uh, but, you know, I had to put up with this nonsense uh, and, and even accuse me of, uh, leaving, uh, of causing, you know, a circumstance where the engine could fail because he said, I didn't put the carter pin back in the oil cap and, and the vibrations could have caused the cap to, uh, unscrew. And because we we're, uh, of flying, uh, the uh, wind would pull the oil out of the, uh, reservoir, hence causing the engine to seize. And we would have to do a forced landing. I know that I didn't do that. And that was the day that I asked for a change of instructors. Well, because exactly. if this guy's going to, if he's going to lie and say that I did something that I know I didn't do because I was meticulous about everything. So, uh, but you just have to understand who you're dealing with. That was my second question on this issue, which was the subjective nature of your instructor's evaluations. So, uh, knowing that in circumstances like you're articulating, there's the checklist that would be that he would go through but then there were also the subjective factors that uh would enable him to fail you if he so chose to because he didn't like the fact that you tied your shoes because you're right-handed versus tying your shoes because you're left-handed or what you know whatever it might be um speak to that please well, th that that was the case. In fact, uh, one of my dearest friends who's now made transition, Robert B. Clark Jr., he and I started in the same class. We didn't graduate in the same class because Bob was uh, terminated from flight training because his instructor said that he could not fly. However, Bob knew how to fly helicopters before he came to flight school. He had the syllabus. He knew everything. 
and he appealed it all the way to the Department of Army, and uh, uh, the base commander was asked to get involved. So he uh, asked Bob, can you fly this helicopter? He says, yes. Well, let's go out to the airfield and let's go fly to the stage field of where your, your, uh, your flight group is flying. He did. I mean, he was off for three months, got in the helicopter, flew out there, landed, and they went and talked to the flight commander and also that instructor. That instructor was fired on the spot. Of course, the flight commander was trying to protect him because it was civilian pilots training us. And they were with Southern Airways based out of Birmingham, Alabama. Mm. So, again, that cultural piece. Was uh, that Birmingham or Bombingham? Well, <laughs> both. <laughs> Wait, what, what year are we talking about? We're talking about 1967. Okay. We're talking Bombingham. Yes, yes. 1967. Okay. So you have uh, people who don't want to see you there in the first place, and that mm -hmm. was this rule. There's only going to be one black graduate per class, just one. I don't care how many stars, there's only going to be one. But after complaints uh, by uh, Bob, by me and others about what the situation was, in fact, um, that was a program. Uh, you had these uh, data sheets that you would answer your questions on when the final exam for any of the courses we were taking. And they could program things uh, based on your the way that we're using social security numbers then. Even if we knew that we scored 100 based on going down after the test was over and looking at what you had marked versus what the answers were, black pilots could only get in the 80s, mid 80s. If you got everything right, you were in, in uh, the low to mid 80s. You never got higher than 86 on any exam. Because if you were just average um, going through your flight training, and you were excellent with your academics, you could wind up being in the running for on a graduate for that particular class. So they they programmed uh, that the black pilots could not score 100 on all of the, the written exams. So that was another trick. And, and it was proven that that was the case. So there are all kinds of obstacles out there, but you just have to be well versed enough to understand and identify and just not take things. You know, I, I saw uh, during the civil rights era where corporations would uh, come and they'd say to people oh, who had degrees, do you have a college degree? Oh, you're different. They, they try to tell them, oh, you're a different kind of black person. And uh, they give them jobs. So, you know, jobs that black people never had an opportunity to have, make the kind of money. And then you have some of these people who got that because people were, were demonstrating in the streets and some people got killed. They said, well, I have to pick my fight. Well, no, the fight picked you. Now, do you have the uh, fortitude to stand up and fight the fight, or are you just going to acquiesce and say nothing and go along with uh, maltreatment? What you just uh, discussed in terms of taking the exams and the particular uh, scoring parameters that were set, one of the things that both of my parents would say to me repeatedly, but my mother was incredibly emphatic, you have to be three times as good, four times as smart, and work seven times as hard because you're Black in America, and with that, you'll only get half as far. And she, because when it came to, to education and grades, my folks didn't play. And, yeah. and, and that, was, that was their thing. You have no idea how hard you're going to have to work to be, ex to be successful because you're, because you're Black in America. And what you just articulated is the living example. And the other thing, when I went to law school, uh, what I found out my first year was if I was in a class, I actually it was my second year, um, I was in a contract negotiating class and kicked everybody's butt in the negotiating uh, rounds that we would go through, only got a B. Mm -hmm. And what I found out was the A's were reserved for the third year students who needed that A. There were only <laughs> going to be a certain number of A's awarded and they were reserved for the third year students who needed that grade to increase their GPA. <laughs> yeah. You know, the thing is, this system was not designed by us. It's not a fair system. 
but we have to learn how to navigate it. And, and unfortunately, some of what I call the under 40 crowd, young people who are 40 and under, maybe I can increase the, the, the year by, by another five years or so, they came up thinking that things are fair and, uh, you know, it's, it's all about uh, your qualifications and, 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 your, and your abilities. But there is a whole nother system that mm-hmm. governs uh, whether you get an opportunity, whether you succeed or whether you fail. And the thing is, you need to be aware enough to navigate those challenges. And some of but our you know, young people you, aren't. It, well, you just said be aware enough. And what I have found is a number of uh, my contemporaries, they don't want to have these these discussions with their kids. They don't want to sit. When I, when I taught at Howard, uh, I would say to my students, you know, you got to be three times as smart and work for Many of them, they never heard that before. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Leon, what are, yeah. you, what, are you, what are you talking about? Well, that's life in America. Oh, mm-hmm. no, 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 not anymore. Mm-hmm. Oh, Dr. Leon, you don't understand. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well <laughs> that, that's the brainwashing. That's the brainwashing that's take, taking place. Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> example, uh, I used to wear a, uh, a P51 pin and I'd paint the cockpit black. And that was several of those black pilots who did that. Mm-hmm. And that was just honoring the Tuskegee Airmen because they were the first two people in mass to show that we could do this. But you had pioneers like uh, Eugene Jock Bullock, who was a, a World War I fighter pilot, had to go to Germany. I'm uh, not Germany, to, uh, to France. 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 But he caught a, a ride to France on a German boat, learned to speak German <laughs> en route. <laughs> And he wound up uh, during World War II of being in the French underground because he had a nightclub uh, in, in Paris and the German officers wanted to come and enjoy the entertainment and the music and, and the atmosphere. So he got a lot of intelligence that he passed on to the French underground and he and Charles de Gaulle were good friends and he was uh, given uh, uh, awards. The Legion of Charles- Merit? Say again? The French, uh, uh, French Legion of Merit? Uh, the uh, well, I'd have to do the research, but okay, okay. Charles de Gaulle came to the U.S. and he 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 wound up coming back to the U.S. and he was an elevator man uh, uh, for the NBC where the NBC uh, studios were in in New York, and mm-hmm. he was interviewed. But uh, his background is phenomenal, uh, and uh, I happen to know uh, his grandson and uh, and other members of his family, a cousin. Mm-hmm. But he couldn't fly in America, but in France he did. Bessie Coleman. And you have Chief Anderson, who was the uh, civilian chief pilot for the Tuskegee Airmen, who, by the way, trained Captain Dothert. <laughs> he taught himself how to fly. He wanted to fly. His father bought borrowed money from the pers- white person that he, he worked for, bought a plane for his son. No one would teach uh, chief how to fly, but he'd go to the airport every day and he'd listen to the white pilots as they came back and talk about what they did was successful and the stupid stuff they did. And chief would get in his airplane every day, crank it up and taxi. And one day he taxied fast enough that he lifted off the ground. He said, now I got to figure out how to land this thing. <laughs> Eventually he did get some instruction from the Wright brothers. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to fly one flight with chief. So, uh, I, I guess I'm one degree or two degrees away from the Wright brothers in my my flight journey. Mm-hmm. But you have all those obstacles in the way. Um, you have other pioneers, um, Janet Bragg, Cornelius Coffey. You have um, um, uh, Willa Brown. And, and there are any number of others uh, that we... Um, that have pioneered the way for us. Uh, Chauncey Spencer, uh, Edwin Wright, uh, uh, Dwight, the, the sculptor, mm-hmm. he was chosen to be the first black astronaut, you know, but again, he was a pilot, but then, you know, he, uh, that didn't, the astronaut program because uh, um, they didn't want any uh, blacks in the program. And, uh, he, uh, you know, had difficulties there, but he wound up being uh, followed his passion with uh, in business and with art. And he is one of the most prolific uh, 
sculptors in the country and doing art, our kind of art for us mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. recognize our heroes and sheroes. Uh, you had, uh, as a Morehouse man, you uh, you had a, uh, a relationship with Dr. King. Yes, yes, I did. If you, if you could elaborate on that a little bit, please. Yes. Um, during the Albany movement, uh, uh, I would go down and listen to Dr. King's speech almost every night that I could. So I would catch a ride with uh, teachers who lived in Albany but worked in Dawson, walk to the church, and because we were young, they would put us young people right on the front row uh, below the, uh, the pulpit. And uh, my minister of my church and Dr. King were Morehouse classmates. They graduated at the same time. So he said, well, when you see Martin again, you tell him I said, hello. I did. And so that started a relationship with Dr. King and I. And after my tour in Vietnam, um, uh, my uh, Fox old buddy invited me to Chicago to work on a political campaign, which I did. And that was this organization called the New Breed Committee. And it was, uh, they had a bunch of black organizations that were meeting with Dr. King on this one particular night when they were planning to march through downtown Chicago. So I go to Hyde Park and who do I sit next to? Dr. King. So we uh, reignited our friendship. <laughs> and he was saying during the meeting, we need some young people to lead our march through downtown Chicago. And I said, well, hey, I'll do it. And uh, I got uh, some of my Vietnam buddies and we led that march through downtown Chicago. Um, and then when I did leave Chicago and went to Morehouse for the second time, he, uh, he would come, well, for the first time, actually, because that was 1966. And he says, he would come to the college and say, hey, come, come by the office and talk to me. And I just thought he was being nice. And that's one regret that I, I have that I did not take him up on just going to his church office and sitting down and having a conversation with him. But I, I did become good friends uh, with uh, his press secretary, Junius Griffin. So he and I would have wonderful conversations. So, um, but I'd see Dr. King often, often coming to Morehouse and every time he'd come by the office and talk to me, come by the office and talk to me. And that's something that I didn't do because it's like, he's just being nice. Well, I, now I wished I had. You do your tour in Vietnam, you go to Chicago, Dr. King asks you to lead a protest in Chicago. How did you reconcile what you fought for in Vietnam versus what you uh, were subjected to when you got back home? Well... <laughs> During those days, you know, it was tough with Vietnam veterans coming back. You know, they called us baby killers and spat on us. Um, I, there was no reconciliation. Thing is, is that Vietnam was dangerous. Being black in America was dangerous. So it was no different than walking through downtown Chicago for a purpose for black people in America than going to Vietnam supposedly fighting for democracy uh, when all they wanted to do was have their own independence because. Uh, Ho Chi Minh came to America. He was trying to speak to the president of the United States, and that never did happen for whatever the reasons are. I mean, there are a number of stories as to why it never happened. Mm -hmm. But uh, and Ho Chi Minh lived in Harlem. He worked in a restaurant, but he lived in Harlem. So he understood the plight of black people in the country. <laughs> so <laughs> there was one uh, patrol we were on. You have, you know, North Vietnamese we're out in the middle of nowhere. And they see that the unit is mostly black, wave at each other and keep going. Why are we going to fight each other out here? For what? So it was dangerous. It was dangerous in, in Vietnam. It was dangerous here in America because then, as well as now, you get in the wrong situation in the wrong part of town, you can wind up dead. Mm -hmm. You can so, wind up dead in the right part of town. Well, look, you can wind up dead in your own house <laughs> <laughs> with no consequences. Nobody held accountable. You know, nobody indicted. Uh, and, and Dr. King's last book, where do we go from here? Chaos or Community. He said that shooting was the new lynching. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're living through right now. You know, I, I asked you that Vietnam question because uh, I had an uncle 
uh, Senior Master Sergeant George W. Porter, who was a Tuskegee Airman, uh, an original, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, flew uh, World War II and Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And I'm from originally from Sacramento, California, and uh, my Uncle George lived around the corner. And, and so the Sacramento Kings honored him at, at a basketball game. And he could barely walk by this time. He was about 89, maybe mm-hmm. 90. He could barely walk. But when the when they played the national anthem, he stood up so fast and so erect. And so when it was all over, I said, Oh, help me understand something. He said, What's that, son? I said, How is it? That with all that you went through, and he used to tell me all these stories about mm-hmm. all the stuff that he was subjected to. I said, how is it after all that you went through, you still have the reverence that you have for this flag? And he looked at me like I had three heads. And he said, boy, that's my flag. I fought for that flag. I risked my life for that flag. Just because they want to claim it doesn't make it theirs. Mm -hmm. Do you understand me? Yeah, Unc, I got it. And uh, so I, I, that's why I asked you that question. Well, you know, just on, on the question of flags, black people live on a lot of different flags. But almost anywhere you go in the world, we're treated the same, mm-hmm. you know. So, so just you know, uh, to me, uh, a flag is just a marker. It, it is not something to be reverenced, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, America treated me poorly in some instances, but America gave me opportunities as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, just need to understand. This is where, to me, uh, the, the the principle that's going to liberate us all is where is the fairness. Where's the fairness in this whole process? Because you have communities that have been deliberately destroyed by local, federal, and state governments because Mm -hmm. Black people were successful. Jacksonville, Florida, for an example. Mm -hmm. Highway 5, right through the Black community, destroyed it. Other places. Oakland, Detroit. Yes. Yes. Cleveland. uh, uh, Urban renewal. Yes. And the interstate highway system yes. has has decimated African American communities. Yes, and and you have uh, you have off ramps to get into the community, but you don't have on ramps for people to leave the community and get back on the freeways. Uh, the freeway in in uh, in New Orleans that goes past I don't know the remember the name of it, but it goes past the Superdome. Yeah. Uh, that, that's another example of of how that has decimated the communities. Yes, yes. And that's by design. Mm-hmm. You know, and people talk about the government. Well, the thing is, the government, we, you, you have to demand treatment from government, from anyone who is, who, who have laws. And, and, and of course, you have to understand laws are things that are written on paper. But the real law is whatever that judge says. And you can appeal it if you want to, but you might fight for who knows how long and have how many different appeals to different courts. But the law is whatever that judge says. Look at Plessy versus Ferguson. Separate mm-hmm. but equal is the law of the land. Mm-hmm. Then you have uh, the, the 54 uh, Brown versus Board of Education. No, separate is not equal. Okay. Same document, different judges. So mm-hmm. when that happened, in my mind, it's like, wait a minute. There's something not right about this whole picture. Because why you have the same document, where is the fairness in all of that? What is really right? And now you have school desegregation, but you have uh, most of the teachers are female and they they are not black. And you have this whole school system of charter schools being created by white women who didn't want their children to go to school with black children. So you still have, you know, people say, oh, we have overcome. Oh, it's, it's, it's better now. Yes, it's different, but in a lot of ways, it's the same. So what do you see as being the, if we if we look at the, again, I gave the, the data a little earlier, uh, about 3% uh, 
of commercial pilots are African American. The system that they're flying under now uh, does not seem to be that much different from the system that you flew under when you were in the commercial space. Well, that's true. You you have well, you you have uh, airlines having their own programs, which we tried to get them to do decades ago. They didn't do it until they had the, the, the critical pilot shortage. But it was OBAP that had the first U.S.-based flight training program from no time to getting you into the commercial space. That was a, a, uh, um, a venture between OBAP, the Organization of Black Airline Pilots then, and Western University with the support of Kellogg and uh, the Transportation Department. You had foreign pilots being trained from no time to becoming first officers for British Airways, Emirates, the United Arab Emirates, and Aer Lingus uh, in Ireland. So I'm saying, well, wait a minute. Why don't we create a program where black pilots who are uh, black people who want to become pilots, who have degrees, go through the interview process, go through the testing process, and if they qualify and, and this meets the criteria for what the airlines want, then let's train them and let's move them into commercial airline space. Well, that program lasted until uh, uh, money was uh, diverted from training black pilots to buy an airplanes. Uh, and now the airlines are replicating what was done by OBAP and Western University, West, uh, Western Michigan University. Is there a sense of camaraderie today amongst black pilots that there was when you were coming through the system? Or do many of them feel a sense of accomplishment and a sense of success and participation in the system to where that sense of com camaraderie isn't deemed necessary? Hopefully that made sense. Well, uh, kind of both are true at the same time. Two, two officers can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, the younger group, if they kind of know each other, then there's that camaraderie. You know, hey, we're going to we're going to support each other. We're going to party together. Hey, we're going to have each other's back, you know, when doing the ups and the downs and all of that. But among uh, those of us who came along early, we would talk about who, whoever was being uh, put upon by, by the system or by that airline or by something, we knew about it and we would support because we, if something was happening at one airline to a black pilot, we look for it to happen at our airline. So how did we um, outmaneuver that? How did we navigate those systems? How, how did we learn from those challenges so that we wouldn't even be confronted with those, those issues? So, but now the young people who know each other, they tend to have that camaraderie. But with us, hey, if you, if you were a brother or, and when uh, sisters, uh, uh, black women became pilots, we embraced and supported them uh, because uh, we knew how tough it was going to be for all of us. Young young people, they think it's oh well, hey, you know it's it's fair. And, and I, I, the story I wanted to tell about the pen I used to wear, oh, uh, yeah. with the T fifty one and the um, with the cockpit painted black. Oh, there was a, a white um, a pilot and a black pilot, and they were both academy graduates, Air Force Academy graduates. And the white pilot said, "Oh, Tuskegee Airmen." I said, "Oh yeah, yeah, you know." I said, "They they they're some of my heroes." And the black pilot says, uh, what? Uh, and then the white pilot told him, oh, the Tuskegee Airmen did this, 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 and this. He said, oh, well, I guess I need to brush up on my history. I said, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, I mean, you're Air Force Academy grad and you don't know who the Tuskegee Airmen are. That tells you, that gives you some idea of the deficit in a history that is not being taught among our own people. And some people think that because they have a job and some money in the bank or millions in the bank, that they are immune. None of us are immune from how this system operates when it operates against us. And we need to own our own. We need to train our own. Uh, we're at a point now where um, 
there's no way that we should be dependent on somebody else to teach or train our own because as I experienced during my first, uh, uh, with my first stint with my first flight instructor, you can be taught wrong. The subject can be covered with the items need, that need to be covered, but you can be taught wrong. And sometimes, uh, for example, just one degree off on a heading for 60 miles, you are one mile off course. So small deviations can cause you to be way off course if you continue on that path. So we really need uh, to know our own history. We need the truth to be taught so that our young people understand, number one, who they are to this, this social system that we live under. And who we are to each other, that we'd better have each other's back and hold each other accountable. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Just because you're black, you don't get a chance and all this, I don't snitch well. Thing is, is that what you need to do is hold somebody accountable for bad behavior and destructive behavior in our own community. And we need to understand that our communities are precious and that we need to maintain the land that we have, the homes that we have in our communities because others will come in. And you won't recognize it five, 10 years from now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm chuckling because I'm debating. I, I'm going to go ahead and bring this up just to your point. When the Fonnie Willis situation developed in Atlanta, I did a show criticizing her for the horrific mistake that she made resulting in the process that she had to go through. And the whipping I took, mostly from Black women, mm -hmm. because all I was saying was that behavior is indefensible, especially at that level. She's playing at the level of the game where She's going after the former face of the empire. Yes. You can't, you know, I, 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 and I made the comment, you have now brought this on yourself because you, you couldn't keep your panties on and homeboy can't keep his fly up. Mm -hmm. Man, <laughs> they came at me. But, you know, um, I hate black women. I have a colonized mind. Uh, oh, uh, you know, who am I to, oh, because one of the points I made was the community should not be tolerating this type of behavior. We don't want to go and tell our daughters or go and tell our sons that they're supposed to, you know, engage like this in the workplace. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. It was brutal. It was but, brutal. But, but, and you can, you can attest to this. There's a course that you have in ethics in law school. So, hey, where is that? <laughs> you know, I, I like I like the philosophy of uh, of Maynard Jackson, uh, first black man of Atlanta. He says his philosophy was if you are close enough to see the line that you're not supposed to cross, you're too close. So and, and young people need to understand that, hey, you know, that you, you can take risks, but don't take risks on things that are going to come back and, 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 and hurt you. And we used to be told there's always somebody watching you. And they were talking about God, the creator. There's always mm -hmm. somebody watching you. Well, now there's always somebody watching you because you have these devices that your, your, your cameras can be turned on, uh, microphones turned on, track wherever you are. So, and, and what did they, and what, what was one of the things that they got her on? Cell phone records. Yes. Yes. Cell phone records. Yes. Well, yes. you said that you only visited him so many. Oh, but his phone seemed to wind up uh, <laughs> in your driveway <laughs> fifty-five times. Yeah, you know. Uh, now, it's, and and because I, I, when I worked in in uh, in corporate America, I at one point I taught um, uh, sales ethics to to the sales team, and my line to them was, the appearance of impropriety in many instances could be worse than the impropriety itself. Yes. So just ask yourself, how does it look? And yes. if it looks bad, it's going to be bad. Yes. That... Simple enough. Hey, simple enough. You, uh, 
you and I did a show last week, and as a result of that show, uh, you got a phone call from a young man who was very, very encouraged by what you had to say, a lot of which we have we have covered covered in this conversation. And he said to you that you, uh, through your story, let him know he had a lot of work to do in his community. Could, could you elaborate on that, please? Yes. Well, uh, it's a group of us who are in narrative and learning about our history, uh, understanding uh, the principles of Africana studies that no matter where you, in the world you are, you're an African and you're a black person. And there's a whole system that's designed not to have you rise above a certain level. And so, uh, and how do we recapture? And when do we start our history? If we started in 1619, we've cut ourselves out of millennia of uh, culture, uh, religion, <laughs> uh, spirituality, science, inscribed on the pyramid walls. Our people have depicted surgical instruments that are used to this day. So <laughs> the Greeks did not invent medicine. Hippocrates was not uh, uh, the one who basically founded medicine, not the father of medicine. Mm -hmm. It was African folk, folks that look like you and I. So with that, wh where is our mindset? And why, what are we waiting on? So it, it encouraged him to do the work in the community. So one of the things that I've learned through the years is that for a group of people to make progress or to make any change, good or bad, you have the square root of that number of people, say uh, 300,000. Well, you need 600 people, like-minded folks working and moving in the same direction, maybe not always agreeing, but you're like-minded in making things better and you're doing the work on the ground to make it happen with whatever your talents are. That shifts the entire population. And so he talked about, hey, we, we need to find a way to make this happen so that we can do our work on our own, teach our children. So, uh, and, and he's on the ground doing just that. So he said, hey, I, I figured it out. I know what we need to do. This is what we need in, in these uh, parts of town. And how, you know, now it's, we have the template. Now we got to do the work to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And and uh, one of the elders said, "Hey, we already have the teams in place. It's just a matter of educating the teams to get them to think outside of the the, the borders that they live in, and expand their minds and understand that hey, we were educating folks long before we came to America." We had culture. We had all kinds of things. Now, again, I have to say that everything about Africa is not glor glorifiable, mm -hmm. but there are some things that are. So you pick the best because when you do your best, you're going to get better and you're going to advance things rather than destroy things. Huh. Captain Clovis Jones, Jr. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your work. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, you're more than welcome. It's, it's my pleasure. And thank you for having me. Oh, well, I'm going to have you back. <laughs> folks. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. folks, thank you so much for listening to the Connect Connecting the Dots podcast with me, Dr. Wilmer Leon. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. Also, please, please follow and subscribe. Leave a review. Share the show. Uh, follow us on social media. You can find all the links below in the show description. And remember, this is where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Talk without analysis is just chatter, and we don't chatter on Connecting the Dots. See you again next time. Until then, I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Have a good one. Peace and blessings. I'm out. Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge.